Well, Mike, what are we doing today? Yes. So last year, giving or sorry, Giving Tuesday raised two point seven billion dollars. We don't know what it will be this year in twenty twenty two, but um, we know that more institutions every year seem to jump onto the trend, and uh, we want to make sure our uh, friends at campuses are prepared. So we have two amazing guests today from Mongoose, Lauren Yeager, and from RNL, Brian Gower. Um, Lauren and Brian, uh, in that order, why don't you uh, introduce yourselves? Hey, everybody. Lauren Yeager from Mongoose here. I'm so happy to join you today. Anytime I can connect to my advancement roots, I'm here for it. Um, I served about 10 years in uh, advancement, kind of uh, on the nonprofit side and, of course, higher education. Most recent uh, higher ed role was major gift officer at Kent State University and just really looking forward to speaking with you all today about Giving Tuesday. Brian. Born from Damon College, as she put in the University. Chat. Yes. There we go. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Damon University. Yeah. That's right. Thanks for she wrote, she wrote Damon College alumni here. So uh, sorry. Brian. There we go. <laughs> That's what my diploma says. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. Those colleges that changed to universities uh, later. Hey, everybody. This is Brian Gower. I, I'm at RNL. I'm RNL's Giving Geek and Vice President for Research. In my 10th year for the company, I've been engaged in higher education for 25 years, served in roles on the student affairs, admission, then annual giving and major gift side, and now work for RNL, a platform company that helps uh, charities and a lot of higher education institutions engage students and donors across the life cycle, all the way back to when you're 14 years old, looking at a school, all the way up to the ultimate gift. So I uh, have a lot of access to a lot of data. I'm excited to share with you today. And thanks everybody for joining to find out more about how you can do better on Giving Tuesday and other giving days. Now I'm ready to go, Mike. I think so. And one thing we don't do here at FYI is- We don't bury the lead. We don't bury the lead. Never. We're in sync. We're ready. Now we're ready for the episode. Mike, I'm just in Timberlake. Uh, we're about seven weeks out from Giving Tuesday. So Brian, uh, where what should institutions do right now to prepare? Okay, so I think probably the first thing is to make sure you know what your Giving Tuesday presence is going to be. <clears throat> that probably involves a platform. <clears throat> Although we've seen many institutions successfully utilize, uh, say, for example, existing crowdfunding resources on Giving Tuesday, that's a perfectly a fine option as well, too. So you definitely want to say, okay, what is it going to be like on the Giving Tuesday experience? If you're going to be looking at a Giving uh, Day platform, something like Scale Funder, Give Campus, Give Gab, a, a number of op opportunities out there for you, um, or you're going to be using a specific page to your institution, I would say paying attention to what the donor experience on that day is going to be on Giving Tuesday a little bit less of a whole, oh, we're going to see that total rise with people constantly clicking on the page. That's a little bit different if it's your secondary giving day, but if it's your primary giving day, definitely want to get that all set up so that people can uh, see that um, uh, total rise. That's called the bandwagon effect, by the way, one of your chief currencies in getting donors to, to join a, a group and be social in their giving. And then I think the second thing is by now, really this week, you should be in sync with your major and plan gift staff for any challenges, matches, or gifts that are going to be announced on the day to build excitement. So you definitely want to have that in place. Then I would say, you know, in the next couple of weeks, your pre-giving Tuesday communications are probably going to get started as well too. So you want to have that communication plan. And really within the next few weeks, knowing what you're going to be doing on the day of. A key component of that is likely to recruit some volunteers or ambassadors, whatever you call them. Might be as simple as taking a look at your student engagement center, that thing we used to call Phonathon, and having a plan for Giving Tuesday on that day. But I would think about all those key components right now. Um, it is a global movement, so I don't want to stress everybody out with this gigantic list of, oh my God, if we can't get this all done, we can't participate in Giving Tuesday. You have participate, you have permission as part of a global movement to participate in Giving Tuesday at whatever level you're capable within your resources, and you should definitely do it. But those are some of the key things you should be thinking about. What What are your suggestions, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, to that point, I, I think about the littlest of shops on the call today, and I know how, you know, coming from a little shop, um, uh, my first role was at Damon University, then college, as um, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving, and you know, sometimes these I would come to these webinars and I'd be like, what applies to me? Like, we don't have these resources, and so I think it's really important to stay focused Focus on the things you can control and the resources that you have and just execute the most uh, minimum viable, effective thing that will work for you all. And so um, start thinking about your content. What is the angle you're taking to this day? If you already do a giving day for your institution, how is this different than that? And I encourage you to make it very distinctly different so that it stands out as, as something different than the other thing. Um, and, and what does that look like? 
what's involved, what's the messaging, um, who's involved, maybe a much more targeted than your institutional day of giving where it's like all hands on deck, any cause, any reason, we just want everyone at the table. You can really use this as an opportunity to be more targeted and highlight a specific thing that maybe reinforces your institutional brand on this day. Um, I'm going to talk more about, you know, what you could consider, um, you know, taking the, the helm of that day. But think about it being focused. You don't have to do all things that all institutions do. Pick a handful of impactful things and just reinforce your simple, clean, targeted message. Do you think institutions should do both a Giving Tuesday and a Giving Day campaign, or should they pick one or the other? What are your thoughts? Well, I would say on your Giving Tuesday choice, you either are or aren't part of a global philanthropic movement, and you are. So you're going to do something on Giving Tuesday. You may make the choice, as Lauren suggested, it'd be, be fairly minimal, right? Mm -hmm. But you definitely need to participate in Giving Tuesday. There is no evidence to suggest that participation in Giving Tuesday uh, hurts your, your other giving day. Um, and by the way, that's a kind of fundraiser facing concern, let people give and be excited. Uh, but I think definitely uh, you want to do something on Giving Tuesday. I think when, uh, as, as Lauren said, you know, that idea of how do you differentiate the Giving Tuesday, I would say um, Giving Tuesday, you have a little bit more permission to be specific in what you're funding. Uh, what we're seeing trending right now, uh, food insecurity as a key concern, mental health, social justice. And I've also seen some institutions do quite effective work on Giving Tuesday with veterans support. So those would be probably four of the initial areas that I would suggest might have some opportunity for you on Giving Tuesday. I think, um, I don't know if people heard this from me before, I've talked about the idea of three prepositions that drive giving, uh, two, four, and through. So on your giving day, your main giving day, you're going to have a lot of people who just give because of your brand. And that's giving to your university or to your organization. On Giving Tuesday, you might have an opportunity to focus a little bit more on four, which is where people are giving for a very specific purpose. But don't neglect that final preposition through, which is the opportunity for you to be part of a global movement and say, we do some things out in the world that may even be associated with other charitable organizations. And by giving through us, you can benefit those organizations as well, too. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for partnership on Giving Tuesday. Any higher education institution, for example, you have education students on a daily basis out in schools. And there's a tremendous opportunity to support the, the, the education outside of higher education for the work you do in higher education. So that kind of giving through. So I just encourage everybody to think a little about with every appeal, whether it's giving Tuesday or giving day, to, for, and through. To your brand, to your mission, to loyalty, for a specific purpose or to impact change, to impact a specific cause, or through, kind of through our partnership with what other places we're doing in the world. If you focus on those three things, you can put together some pretty powerful messaging. I don't know what you think of that, Lauren. Oh, no, I love it so much. And um, Brian and I haven't got much interaction before today's webinar, and I, you know, reviewing some notes together, I just like emphatically like nodding my head yes and and I think about when giving Tuesday is right let's let's just level set right it's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving it is a season of being thankful so the areas that we you know we're not going to tell you what what cause to highlight on your campus but there's some very logical things probably unique to your institution or somewhat unique to your institution that make logical sense my last uh, fundraising role outside of higher ed was a major gift officer at Second Harvest Food Bank, in Middle Tennessee. And um, there are so much crossover in the missions of um, what colleges and universities are doing and engaging with outside in the community. You all have a very large economic impact on your communities and using um, this day to highlight those things, what your faculty, staff, and students, athletes are doing out there in the community um, is could be really impactful. Impactful. You also know the key players in your community um, that support multiple causes. I'm thinking about those families that are just supporters of everything in your region. And there might be an opportunity to create, say, a matching campaign that benefits your organization and a partner organization. So use the creativity and the people you know and the causes that they're passionate about um, to kind of draw those um, kind of logical partnerships that might be unique to your institution and and consider making them kind of a, a forefront or a focus for the day. I think that Giving Tuesday is the ultimate over-solicitation insurance. 
everyone's going to be talking about giving on Giving Tuesday. So just go for it. Yeah. Just rock and roll, have fun, talk about impact. Uh, there's just tremendous opportunity. You, it's kind of the one day you get a little bit of a pass on asking too much. I yeah. like that. This is a product of uh, you getting good guests often on FYI. Yeah. I just want Brian and Lauren just to keep going back and forth. <laughs> and we are just going to nod. Yeah, we're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna, well, no, I want to stand here and listen and nod for 45 minutes. Um, speaking well, speaking of, of questions. Speaking yeah. of questions. So we've seen consistent growth in Giving Tuesday, I believe just under 9% uh, historically year over year. Um, do you think that's realistic, Brian? Do you think it's going to plateau? What are your thoughts? Uh, it's going to keep growing. Uh, the, the world is actually quite philanthropic. Uh, we know from research that Americans are very philanthropic. Um, I think there's going to be a tremendous opportunity to see things grow. I think it's important for us to recognize too that when we say 2.7 billion, it's likely a significant undershoot because our mm -hmm. systems don't always pick up the different ways that people are going to give. Uh, I I've seen stuff that indicates that on Giving Tuesday, we might see people just organically give out in the world uh, with cash in a way that's not going to be tracked. Um, we're getting better at tracking that stuff. But of course, we got to keep in mind that there are just so many ways that people give now, whether it's GoFundMe to check out giving to uh, an opportunity that presents itself out on the street. Right. Um, so I, I think we're going to see things continue to go grow. Um, it is important to recognize as well, too, that most of the growth in giving in terms of dollars has come from mega gifts. Right. So in the same way that we're seeing income inequality really impact American life, there is a, um, a big, you know, wide path between people who are giving kind of a regular basis and those principal givers as well, too. Really cool thing about a global philanthropic movement, and this goes back to the roots of, of Giving Tuesday. The idea is really to get everybody uh, together democratically with a small d, you know, uh, uh, on the same team for giving on that day. Um, so I think it's going to continue to be very powerful. Um, we will see an impact towards immediate liquidity-based giving during a time of economic challenge. And I'll do the nerd breakdown on that. When there's no appreciated stock, it's difficult to get people to give appreciated stock, right? It's the realities of the situation that we're in right now. But we can see, and this is from Giving USA data, that even times of economic challenge, we see giving immediately rise to meet that need. We certainly saw it in the pandemic. We saw it in the, in the Great Recession. One of the reasons why we know the Great Recession is so great is that we then saw giving decline a little bit as, as the pit got dug a little bit deeper, right? Absolutely crucial for something for you all to notice as fundraisers is that within three or four years of that dip, we will always, and this goes back 75 years, we'll see an increase in giving. So you will either be ready for that rocket increase in giving when the economy improves, or you won't. And one of the key ways that you'll be ready is to build a loyal donor base that is educated about your impact. That's the work we have to do right now. It doesn't have to be a loss leader. You can certainly make money while you do that. But that's the key activity now as we see, uh, as we, we kind of move through this period of economic uncertainty. Uh, what do you think, Warren? Yeah, no, I, I I agree there. And I think if we're doing our job of, as I was mentioning, kind of doing some more permission to have some more targeted campaigns on this day, you're going to attract some donors that may have not been responsive to your messaging before. Um, and then next year, it's your task, right, to retain those donors. And yet, here we are another year, another opportunity to, to set the focus on a different initiative, uh, yet never letting go of those that we engaged the year prior. And so as you do these each year, you have this bank of folks who had given the year prior to whatever inspired their messaging. And it's really on you to track that, listen to your donors and then retain them. Uh, so those first time donors are not, um, you know, part of the leaky bu bucket problem, but that you're not forgetting about what motivated them to give in 2022 and ensuring that you're um, being more inclusive every year uh, to the past campaigns you've done and also the future ones that you're you're setting out to focus on. Boy, I want to go off script by yeah. something Lauren said. Um, this could go anywhere. Um, you, you talked about um, people being in the right mindset to give and how that can change on any given day. And I, you know, you can certainly anyone here today put that in a personal uh, matter when you when you have been prompted for the opportunity to give to an organization, where are you? How are you seeing this message? Would you have given yesterday if not today? So how much should institutions think about that? Like in terms of being afraid to over message or how you craft your message, people's mood changes day to day, their situation changes every day. Um, like how much thinking should you put into that? Well, Mike, I'll tell you, we can see, and we're with Mongoose here. So let's talk a little bit about texting. 
What I can tell you is that uh, if you text somebody during the year, they're between two and three times more likely to give. We're, we're reviewing RNL data right now and seeing that that's the case. If they respond to your text, I'd be interested to hear you, Mike and Greg, how you feel about this. They're between 10 and 15 times more likely to give. Mm -hmm. So one of the key that's answers it. to this question is to just talk with your donors, right? Uh, that may be a volunteer group, that may be ambassador groups, people who, who serve with you. Keep in mind that the people who choose to be on a volunteer board are already sold. <laughs> so we need to do also uh, more research and listening and things like that. Um, but part, part of the thing that makes a difference is that if your communications are interactive as opposed to just constantly broadcasting, that'll really change the dynamic. And particularly as we, as we look towards uh, younger donors, um, both millennial and Gen Z donors. Keep in mind that these are content creators, right? Every, what was the SNL joke this last Saturday? 86% of young people say their top job is influencer, right? And then she, whatever, threw the wine or hit the, I, it was a funny skit, right? I can't right? stay up late enough to watch Saturday <laughs> Yeah, Live, But it's, so it's a hilarious skip. It's a hilarious script where they just, uh, you know, the fake game show where they're just playing people, these telling people these things over the last few years and then they go kind of go crazy a little bit. But, you know, it's important, you know, messaging as a charitable entity today really means conversation. And that's why a P2P based, you know, legal, uh, carefully crafted, a friction free engine like a cadence is going to be really helpful. Okay, so I don't work for Mongoose, you know, they told me we're not going to be overly commercial. But having we can see this and, and I've, I've read individual text messages, and I publish some of this stuff on our blog periodically, where, you know, literally, we have a student ambassador texting somebody that we couldn't reach on the phone. And the person says, thanks so much for the link. It was a hassle to give last year. <laughs> right. And, and the unit cost of that solicitation, which is going to lead to a 200, 300, 400 dollar gift is like when you model it out, it's like nothing. Right. And so, and so I think really focusing on interaction would be one key thing to do, even on Giving Tuesday. Yeah. It's Greg, you know, it's funny. The thing that I would add to that is that I think we all suffer a little bit from ADHD and that's not to uh, diminish those who genuinely suffer with a disorder, but I will say that, um, my mood at any given moment can be very different. And some of it comes back to what Brian was saying, the SNL skit with like, you know, you hear a headline and you're just like, Gah! and so like in that moment, I'm in a different headspace than I was just, you know, seconds prior. And so the more personalized your medium is, Brian mentioned texting, obviously that's something I care deeply about, but the more personalized it is, which I would say texting is probably the most personal, the more important that messaging is because you are only catching them in the moment that they are in, in their headspace at that moment. And so creating, I know I joked with a vibe, but messaging is really important. If it's a different medium, an email where I, I have the bandwidth to digest some more information, you can really create an environment and a story that's impactful, that will motivate me. The text you know, maybe it's a, a, a sh short picture or a video that you can um, send along with it to create the experience that you want them to feel that motivates the giving. So, um, you know, blasting out it's Giving Tuesday, click here to donate is not going to do it for me. It's right. just not going to do it. Um, so I need I need some more information like why today and not yesterday, to your point. Great. Right. And, and that would be a great message to send people that you can model on your data that are likely to give. Maybe they've given on previous Giving Tuesdays, whether you're Laurel li Loyal Live Ons and it's around the season that they tend to give. That would be exactly friction free the way you want to do it. Hopefully that link leads to a mobile friendly. I love how many people text out links to things that are that not mobile friendly. You're literally sending to something to somebody's cell phone and directing them to a not mobile friendly site. If you need a mobile friendly giving site, contact me. I give you some recommendations, but we've got to fix that problem first. It's got to be easy to give. Those people who, who are, are on the fence and just need that little nudge, absolutely. As Lauren said, for other people who really need to establish a relationship with you, maybe it is a bit of back and forth. If it's people who have given at some point in the past, you're fairly certain that they understand the mission. Maybe you do want to go towards the impact story, right? So really thinking about those potential segments. I think the other component of it is, is we as fundraisers can fall into the trap of segmenting people and thinking we know what type of people they are. Look at your data. You know, if you can see that um, the last few humorous things that you've done, this person's really engaged with, hit them with humor on Giving Tuesday. If that person is, uh, you know, all they've ever done is supported medical research or your associated medical system, hit them with a healthcare example, right? That's our responsibility to personalize as fundraisers. It's not that hard to do. 
Yeah, and, and your system should be able to do that, whether it's your CRM or the engagement software you're using, you should have ways of flagging, tagging, or otherwise categorizing people into these like buckets that make that personalization realistic for your institution. Um, Kim Ferguson had asked that Giving Tuesday is aligning with their annual giving kickoff. And is there a reason to distinguish between the two? My gut says, like, why not use it as a catalyst? Brian, uh, what, what would you say to that? Uh, absolutely. I think, again, pay attention to your audiences. So if you if you have a group of people who are pretty loyal in terms of annual giving, maybe you want to get that annual giving message out to them first and then use Giving Tuesday as a nudge. For the people who have not yet been giving, like like Lauren said, kick off with, with, with Giving Tuesday. Um, I think be really careful when you're thinking about balancing those things on, on certain underserved populations. The most underserved donor population in higher ed right now, for example, is intermittent cybunts. So these are the people who have given three of the last five, two of the last five. There's incredible value of getting those people into a stable annual pattern. It's also, by the way, super tied if you can get them to, to a level of loyalty to potential future major and plan gift, right? And so really thinking about that group of people, uh, there's some awesome ways that you can use dual messaging. I think the other thing too is always just be really careful about fundraiser facing messaging and donor facing messaging. The question about whether or not our annual giving kickoff is going to conflict with Giving Tuesday is largely a fundraiser facing concept. Just make sure that you're only spending a certain portion of your time on fundraiser facing concerns and focusing as, focusing as much as you can on the donor experience. I know, that's, I know that's brutal. I know that's brutal. But sometimes you need like we get in our heads as fundraisers, we get yes. in our and we get in our, you know, corporate mentality of our organizations, even if they're particularly small, just always be thinking, how does this impact the donor experience? My apologies for interrupting. Um, like I was just saying, it's a good thing this is recorded, so yes. people can see people yeah. writing. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of information. <laughs> it's a lot going. easier. When that, you can. That's yeah. that's great. Um, we want to make sure that um, this is for your institution, not our institution. So um, we asked you to answer, ask some questions, and you did. And Colby Adamski, our uh, brilliant producer, is going to um, uh, get those questions flying. Colby, I believe we have some comments and questions that have come in. Yeah, we, are, we have some great questions coming up right here. The first one, which was from Iris George, is wondering if you guys have any examples or case studies Ooh. from a smaller university and something that stood out from their Giving Tuesday, something you can share, or which was also echoed by Rachel Cohen right afterwards. Um, she really wanted to get that insight as well, and especially when it comes to a texting strategy. Okay, so even if it's not like a link to a case study, even if it's just an example of that, yeah. but um, Brian, I'd ask um, uh, if you have an answer to that. If in university, they're going to double their annual giving donors this year. Really, really awesome wow. stuff happening there. Uh, one that I always love uh, of the that. best texting strategy in the world, uh, particularly as it relates to young alumni, UNC Charlotte. Mm -hmm. uh, Mongus oh. has, has uh, spotlighted them before. Really, yeah. really cool mm -hmm. stuff going That's... on there as well, too. I think $90,000 on the last Giving Tuesday for food insecurity. Uh, they, uh, some years back, had actually been one of the first to say, you know, let's focus on veterans on Giving Tuesday. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, those are a couple examples. I don't know, Lauren, you want to add some? Yeah, I was going to put in the chat, but um, I know that, you know, smaller organizations say here, UNC Charlotte, like how, what? But I will say it does apply from a former small shop director myself. It does apply. And let me tell you why. They are very smart at segmentation. They do very specific messaging to very specific audiences, uh, marching band fans. They do uh, campaigns to those alumni marked married to each other. All of us can replicate those things. And so happy to share data. And uh, we've got lots and lots of materials about those. But there's little micro examples of that all over the place. And again, I know it's, it was always my hat to put on too, is like, how does this apply to my institution? It does, I promise. We're not talking about, you know, uh, SEC, uh, you know, focused football donors here. And we really are talking about things that can be replicated at any institution um, out there. Yeah, so for the most part, donors are donors, right? And I've been telling people that I 100% acknowledge that every member of your constituent base is a special snowflake, but with enough of them, I can help you build a snowman. 
So, <laughs> so we, we want to absolutely recognize people's individual preferences. And you can do that very effectively with AI, by the way, uh, that's really come down in cost and become easier and easier to use. But donor psychology is really donor psychology. So focusing on the fundamentals, reducing friction, messaging based on their demonstrated previous interests, whether that's uh, giving or something you know. Um, I, think the, I think the other component too, is we, had, uh, we have somebody ask a question about admission. Uh, are you aware of any admission teams that capitalize giving, on giving day buzz? Here's what I would do. Uh, we are gonna have some people who in this economy or just based on where they're at are not gonna wanna make a monetary donation. But many of our alumni, particularly younger alumni who still have an incredible amount of nostalgia, miss being at school. Uh, th this is true, by the way, for our volunteers and other charities as well, too, might be willing to give their time or their network. Right. And I would love an organization to put out a communication that says, what do you want to do? And there's buttons. Give now, you know, set up a legacy volunteer, right? And that volunteering on the admission side, especially what we're seeing with the, with the demographic cliff and the struggles we're gonna be seeing in admission right now, having people who recruit students, recommend students is absolutely crucial. By the way, within six months, you can go back to that group and ask them to make a donation and you should see about a 90% response rate in terms of donations. So in some cases it's donate first, then volunteer. In some cases it's volunteer first, then donate. Right. And just keep in mind that particularly young people see their social network as more valuable than money. This is from Pew Research. So really getting the younger generation in particular to, to rebroadcast your message. That is, and I know this is scary to fundraisers, that may be bigger than uh, a small gift right now. Again, Ooh, follow up with those people and get a gift. But uh, I, I'd say a dual strategy of seeking uh, the network and the influence along with the gift is going to be absolutely crucial. It should make giving more sticky and lead to a greater major gift pipeline as well. And Mike, that also fits into the more people in your network, all content is admissions content. Correct. Yeah, it came up a couple of episodes ago. So it's all about your school. So all departments. A hundred percent of your content is admission content, including that, the stuff right. you don't make that's sitting out there on social media that you might not be happy with. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Or student organizations make, right? You know, yeah. student organizations are, are why we're here, right? I love that stuff because you can always turn that into look at how engaged we have our students and stuff like that, yeah. you know? Absolutely. So. We've heard some examples. Can you think of any other ways to build off the momentum that uh, Giving Tuesday gives you? Well, I think this gamification thing, and we got that question that came through. I think that can be pretty crucial. I have seen or some organizations do a challenge between uh, maybe several departments uh, or organizations themselves. You throw somebody in a dunk tank, somebody's going to get dunked if the one charity warns versus the other. Um, that tends to that tends to increase fundraising all around. I think you could do that as well too. I think the other thing too is to really get engaged with Giving Tuesday. Uh, we're so excited to be a part of the Giving Tuesday Data Commons. Um, we do a lot of work with them. We're just going to a meeting tomorrow with them on crowdfunding. Nice. But what I would say is, is that looking at the resources that Giving Tuesday has, they've really ramped that up now, taking charge of the fundraising effectiveness project. So you can even see some key fundraising stats. Um, what I see happening with Giving Tuesday is, is moving well beyond just that single day in terms of their total influence. And they've had some great funders, Gates Foundation and others that have helped out. What do you think, Laura? Yeah, um, I, I was kind of thinking on a little bit of a different angle and was talking about momentum is listening to your donors and making sure that the data gleaned that day is not lost. And I know that as fundraisers, we can kind of tuck and roll into the next thing. Um, and we need to really just like pause and see what we were able to to learn that day about our donors, what motivates them to give, what designations they gave to. Um, if you are texting, emailing, whatever you're doing, making sure that those conversations, any, anything important that was exchanged that day is recorded in the donor record for future engagement. Um, so kind of took a little different um, uh, angle to it. And then I would also create a first time giver something, um, communication plan, certainly closing the loop as far as impact goes um, and reporting back on the movement that they were a part of, I think is really key. Uh, I know Mike likes to bring up the Grateful Wednesday thing. Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I if you're, if you're uh, pursuing, <laughs> yeah, well, if you're pursuing uh, Giving Tuesday, um, you should absolutely follow that up with a Grateful Wednesday and thank people for 
um, donating, explain the impacts of the gifts um, in a very clear, articulate way. And then some institutions I've worked with have also offered alumni certain benefits on those days. So for example, some schools might waive fees for um, procuring an official transcript or things like that, that you don't think about, but alumni need all the time. And it's not a, you know, it's not a loss lead or anything for the school. It's you know, very little revenue um, that would be lost. So those sorts of strategies are, I think, very, I think becoming more common. And I love that trend. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, when you get transcripts requests, you know, people are moving on with their education. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe true. they're getting an upgrade at work, right? Because the, the jobs that require an official transcript are usually higher level positions. So mm -hmm. all this is prospect research when you get down to it. Uh, it's remarkable to me how many institutions don't quickly update their databases based on the uh, returns they get. I think really thinking about Giving Tuesday and this season in general for information updates, that's that interactive component asking, you know, can you, can you please just make sure we have your employer, your title, your address, things like that, correct? Uh, that can be pretty crucial for every uh, 700 records you update, we can model out that you're gonna receive half a million dollars or more in additional lifetime fundraising. Some simple reasons for that are, if you have the right information, you can get the your campaigns at the right time to the right people. Uh, secondly, if you don't know that somebody's a CEO, you can't sign out a gift officer, right? So let's just keep in mind that that interactive component can have real monetary value as we model it out downstream from the from the initial contact there. RNL backs it up with stats every exactly. time. I know we're not limited to advancement and fundraising audience here today, but I do love the enthusiasm um, for this. More questions, more comments coming in. Um, and we've had in a couple of FYI. So um, let's get back to that. Colby, what is our next question or comment there in the Ooh, chat? We're, we're keeping you busy today, Adam Ski. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's a great way to enter the uh, FYI realm here. I just want to share a quick comment from uh, Greg McGowan, a uh, client success lead here at Mongoose. He says that he loves the idea of incorporating a volunteer option, echoing what Brian said. He thinks that maintaining that relationship is so important, even if someone can't make a financial gift at the moment. Love to hear that, Greg. And there's a couple of great questions that I want to get to. Um, this one's a little bit more broad, and then the other one's a little more specific um, to this person's institution. Um, this one is from Bailey Faley to, do you ever include current students in your donor messaging campaign? Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. So one of the things that we know from research is that if we change the asker on an appeal, most commonly the asker is the director of the annual fund, sometimes it's the president of the institution and maybe the academic chair. If we change that asker to a volunteer, or a charitable recipient like a student, a different and often larger group will respond. Hmm. So you may be in a cultural or political or social situation at work where it really needs to continue to be that person um, with a title um, that makes the main ask, but follow-up communications in the voice of those three areas, um, academic leadership, um, current students, uh, maybe even thinking about a prospective student that received a scholarship that is excited to attend, those sorts of things uh, can be really powerful. And so I recommend that, it, you know, if you send a direct mail piece and it has to be under usually if the word it's usually the titles I'm talking about have the word vice or president in them, right? Uh, making sure you follow up, but in a different voice from a different perspective, Fe fellow alumnus or volunteer current student, uh, those sorts of things. And, and this applies across the, 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 the way in terms of charity. This can also be really effective on the enrollment side as well too. We fall into the trap of just having admission counselors and current students. We'll get some faculty voices in there as well too. Right. Yeah, I would, I would add to that too, Brian, um, is the, the closing the, of the loop as well. The thank yous, um, simple as a photo of a bunch of students in front of your student center holding a big thank you sign, you know, getting that out there as well. Um, could be a short video um, about an impactful story. Thank you because of your support. I was able to do X um, related to what they gave to. Um, and then also, as far as um, and we were talking about partnering with organizations that your organization is supporting out there, partnering in the community with um, whether it's a homeless shelter, a food bank or whatever, you could actually kind of do a day in the life of a student, um, mm -hmm. kind of follow them and uh, highlight the impact that they've had at that place, but also the impact that that experience has had on them and using it um, as a part of your appeal as well. So in that instance, they're not exactly asking, but they are the content, uh, the message that's being uh, relayed out to the donor. 
And you're likely at a higher education institution, your students are probably not going to be there uh, on Giving Tuesday, depending on your break schedule. Maybe they will be. But uh, leading up to that, one of the things you can do is uh, just go out into the main thoroughfares and ask students uh, to do a thank you note to a donor. You can produce a very simple, here's how to write a thank you note, share some examples. They spend maybe five minutes, give them a cupcake you know, whatever you can afford to do, it can be really powerful. Uh, people say, well, does that, does that increase donor retention? You know what it does? It makes sure that your current students know that your organization is a charitable entity. We right. can very quickly fall into the transactional paradigm, particularly in higher education, because we are expensive. And by nature of our financial aid processes, people stretch to afford these experience. It is outside of purchasing a home, the largest single investment that an American makes is the investment of higher education. Right. So uh, we got to make sure that we establish ourselves as charities. In many cases, people will approach those tables to do a thank you note saying, what do you mean? And you can say, hey, did you know that X percent of the, of the cost of, uh, of your education was covered by donors? Or we have received this how many hundreds of millions of dollars over the last X years, quantifying that. Um, that educational component is extraordinarily powerful as we move forward. So really think about Giving Tuesday and this entire fall season as an educational endeavor. Awesome. Colby, I know you had another one lined up right after that. Absolutely. It's a great one from Emily Schrock. And Emily says that they plan to do a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign before and on Giving Tuesday with a select few employees championing their specific areas. Is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising a good option for Giving Tuesday in this way, she wonders? Yeah, I think so. Number one, make it as easy as possible. Uh, don't try to exert too much control. People talking about giving or people talking about giving, it can be very powerful. Um, what I encourage people to do when you're in the peer-to-peer -peer environment is to really provide very concrete things that people would do the example given here is before and on the day, make sure that you have those. This includes literally pre-writing social posts for people. Mm -hmm. They'll modify them, they'll innovate and change, but we got all got so much going on. Keep in mind as well, too, that your volunteers, if they're not the, not just faculty and staff, probably are volunteering for other organizations because one of the things that we can see in, in charitable data is that many people who volunteer volunteer at more than one. So just being the easiest organization that people have to work with can be really powerful for you. Right. Um, I would say you could take this any direction you want. There are platforms. We have one, for example, that tracks ambassadors. So people get an individual link that gamifies things. So you've got people who get into it and they want to be the one who gets the most gifts on Giving Tuesday. That can be super fun. You don't have to go all the way to that far. That maybe is a, a bit of an advanced strategy. But I would say just give people really concrete things to do. Don't just say, hey, everybody go out and cheerlead on Giving Tuesday. They're not going to do what, know what to do when they wake up. Should wake up to an email for you with, with the very specific instructions on what to do. To that point, uh, Brian, about gamification, I know that there was a question in the chat about gamification too. And um, I always like to share this example. <laughs> um, last uh, Giving Tuesday, I woke up early, you know, I gave to my alma mater, of course. And next thing you know, I get a Facebook message from my aunt, whose granddaughter is goes to my alma mater. She's uh, like a track star there. And it turns out that the athletes were all doing competition of which of the athletes could raise the most money or new don I think it was new donors to athletics so you could have been a prior donor but it had to be a new to this designation new donor and those that got the most donors new donors were going to get like a bump all the all of the coaches had agreed to give a specific amount of money but it was going to go to the sport that got the most new donors so of course i had to give again to my alma mater and so what i would say with gamification is that you'd be really surprised i would have never in a thousand years would have told you that my aunt would be fundraising for my alma mater at some point in my life <laughs> um and so those things actually can have really for my niece or my cousin, whatever she is to me, you know, her, her grandmother is replicated probably a hundred times. There's like a hundred grandmas out there on Facebook trying to get everyone in their circle to donate. So gamification is always worthwhile um, and it doesn't have to be overly complicated. Um, you can scale it to your institution and what works for you. Yeah, and if you're going to gamify, make it participation based, make it number of gifts based. We can see in the data that participation based campaigns, so the ones that are focused on bodies that have given as opposed to total dollars given, they actually raise more money. And that's because the average person can't think of themselves as a per percent of a dollar, but they can think of themselves as the next donor. 
Hmm. Right. So really, when you're thinking about your gamification, lean into participation. I love that idea of the coaches getting together and then seeing who's going to win. We have a couple examples where uh, it's the water polo team that won. Right. And it's like nobody expects that. We expect it to be football, right. basketball. But the loyalty that we see, you know, it's it, 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 it can be a pretty incredible thing. I'm also thinking about Radford University, that structured a giving day, athletics giving day around the idea of one donor per student athlete. So this is almost going back to World Wildlife Fund, sponsor a tiger, right? Uh, really cool stuff. So just having a kind of modest goal of saying, can we recruit uh, one donor per student athlete? Really cool. Never mess with the water polo team. Correct. The, the endurance alone. Yes. Those are the toughest Lower people. body strength. That's right. And yes. giving day strength as well. Very yes. good. So it's interesting you bring uh, this example up. I wonder... Is there a way to balance centralizing versus decentralized? Because obviously the more options you have for donors, the potential for confusion, but then you're also losing an element of community, right? So where do you find the balance there? Oh, fundraiser drama. Okay, <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, so I would say on Giving Tuesday, pick a few things to focus in on. I think we've been pretty clear that this should be a mission and impact message. Um, you might get requests to have a Giving Tuesday campaign. Uh, generally, from what we can see, is that if, uh, if there is a list to program to of at least 200 good email and mobile phone numbers, and about 10% of that population has previously given, you're probably okay to feature them. So that's a decent metric to go by. Um, I would say you got to pick and choose because you're only going to be able to market and publicize so much on a specific day like this. Um, because again, I think we're all recommending that it's probably smaller than your main giving day if you have a main giving day. Um, keep in mind that if someone approaches you and says, you know, can we do this thing on Giving Tuesday? You know, the answer can be absolutely drive your friends to the donation site. You know how people can donate to your program right now. You know, we've already chosen our key charities. We can't, you know, but would you be interested in a crowdfunding campaign that will launch December 1st, okay. right? So always look at the people who approach you and say, can we do, do a thing on Giving Tuesday or any other giving day as an opportunity to engage them further in other ways you're doing fundraising. The fact that they're coming to you and saying, hey, we think we, we can go for some philanthropic support is a good thing. And you can redirect the efforts to things like crowdfunding or, or, or other efforts where you're going to have a little bit of a ramp to work with them a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. We're uh, we still have time left for questions for uh, Brian and Lauren. Uh, great responses, great questions yes. coming in. So thank you for that, um, Mike. There's a texting centric question oh, we is. get almost every episode. Yes. Colby, I want you to ask that because um, it's a question that um, comes up a lot. Um, yeah, guys, absolutely. Um, it's I mean we're talking about uh, gamification a little bit, but is should you wait until your giving day to gamify engagement? Uh, we did cover that. I was talking about Lizzie's question. Oh my gosh. So sorry, guys. So sorry about that. Yep. My bad. You're um, doing great, Colby. Colby's you, is doing fantastic. That's correct. Right. Yeah. This is, this is actually from Lizzie. Um, my team has been told via Mongoose that sending a link slash picture or video text to a donor before they opt in will filter messages like this to spam. Is this still the case or is that not anymore? Short answer, no. No, the link question always comes up and right. it's a complicated answer yes. and we're not couching it, but it is something that's not like... 100% true every single time with every Correct. single uh, example. So we would recommend getting an opt-in, Yes. Uh, first of all. But um, we know that that's not always going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the content of the message is key and the quantity of recipients as well, right? So if I send out a text to 55,000 people that says, uh, I think Lauren used the example of it's giving day, here's a link to give, going to get blocked. If I send out a link that is personalized, or sorry, if I send out a message that is personalized, has a full URL, um, and the call to action is very clear and not salesy. So for example, there was an institution I worked with two years ago on their giving day in the spring. They wanted to send out a text saying, hey, if you gave today, um, you know, send us back your uh, a picture of um, your gift and uh, we'll send you, we'll text you back 20% uh, off the bookstore uh, code. Bad idea. So anything that looks promotional or salesy, more likely to get blocked. But if you keep the messages smaller, or sorry, to a smaller audience, use the full URL, keep it personalized, it's more likely to go through. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nuance in that. 
also omni-channel set up a text yes. that sets sends to an email hey um are you interested in this link we just sent you an email that's a great way to get around that email exactly. set up text which set up emails and it never ends right. omni-channel um, omni -channel amplification that's how we rock and roll that's what you got to do but that idea of saying we're texting you because we just sent you an email is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. um Hey, here's what not to do. Start your texting campaign just on Giving Tuesday and blast giving messages. Um, what you should think about doing is earlier, uh, and this is a great play for those of you in higher ed in this coming up fall, you know, text a group of uh, your constituents a question like uh, the students are moving in today. What advice would you give an incoming student? Right. So you're engaged in a back and forth. You can use that to publish a great content piece. You can reply back to people. But if you've set up that relationship where there's a back and forth, you're going to see much more tolerance on the part of your donors. You're not going to see the opt outs and things like that when you later uh, go and remind them about key things like Giving Tuesday or your giving day or the year end deadline or things like that. Very well said. Excellent. Yeah, not to bring up UNC Charlotte again, but they did win an award for their pre-engagement uh, leading up to a giving day. They did a, a very simple survey asking people what they most identified with as their uh, experience as a student on campus. And then guess what? They used that data to inform a future solicitation that targeted what they most were interested in. Um, and it was done in like a really nice way, basically saying, you know, today's Giving Tuesday, you can give to any designation, including those that support the marching band, you know, back to that. So um, yeah, there's, there's definitely ways to um, get data leading up that's not kind of lip service, but driving meaningful engagement up to those solicitations is really important. Um, I want to go behind the curtain a little bit, Mike. Is it okay if I go behind the yeah, curtain a little bit? And, way, and Brian did touch on this a little earlier, but um, we send the questions to our guests just to give them an idea of what we're going to ask. And sometimes they'll give us input back. And Brian had a response to a question that I really liked. And I don't know if it got enough um, coverage, although it was touched on. So Brian, we were talking about differentiating um, from other institutions, other um, uh uh, fundraising efforts that are going on. And you had a response that uh, differentiating or setting yourself apart is not exactly what you want to do. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I really liked your response to that. Yeah. So I think you want to lean into the global movement here, right? And every one of our organizations is associated with other charitable organizations. And so I would, I would really be careful um, messaging a give to us instead I think what you wanna do is to give with us along with other organizations. Uh, that can be really powerful. So it's, so you are, you are, you know, don't stand out, stand together. Um, and absolutely no problem to have pictures of your students in Habitat for Humanity shirts, building the Habitat for Humanity house, which is, you know, likely part of your institution's culture for decades, right? Um, that's what you wanna do. So we want to be looking at charity as a community effort. And so don't stand out, stand together. Um, be sure you give them the link to your site to give to, you, to your organization. You know, that's where you reduce friction and really channel people. But I would, I would coordinate with other charities. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to do things. I love the headline, don't yes. stand out, stand together. So I do. Glad that I brought it up again. The coordination is very interesting too. I yes. love hearing that. That's not something you would typically. Yeah, there is not a mythical there. donor, for example, that chooses a single charity and get, distributes all their wealth. Is there is still it? time with seven weeks left until giving day to pull that off for this season? I would say this is the week you got to set your platforms up. So yeah. if you don't have great tools like a texting platform, a giving day platform, a crowdfunding platform, you got to get that in place as soon as possible because you got some tech stuff you got to do. Um, absolutely contacting local charities. Uh, I would say on the higher ed side, super easy to do that by just going through your list of student organizations or contacting your colleagues in student affairs and say, we have this idea. Do you have any suggestions? You may come up with something that you can't pull off in seven weeks, but again, then that can be a crowdfunding campaign. That can be a spring appeal. You're building a network there. I'd say one key thing to do as you do that is never go and contact another charity for a one-off. Never go to a student organization. And I see this mistake made 
constantly in the diversity, inclusion, and social justice area. Hey, can we do something with you? And then you kind of disappear from their lives until the next time around. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work with an organization, you're going to work with a student organization, you become a member, you attend, you participate, you use your resources to help them. You're going to see a much stickier and, and greater relationship over time with that. When we take a look at some of the incredible dance marathons, for example, that have developed in higher education, millions and millions of dollars, those are long-standing collaborative efforts, right? Uh, so particularly when you're going out there in the social service world and in the social justice world, uh, when you say, hey, we want to do something with you on Giving Tuesday, do not forget that charity right after Giving Tuesday and then contact them again next year. It's not going to go well. Again, okay. excellent. I'd be curious uh, for Lauren and Brian both. One of the friction points I hear from institutions is how do we approach our most recent graduates? Because I think there's a fear that, you know, the students react and say, oh, here it comes. Now I'm you know, going to be a donor for the next 35 years. So how do you uh, how do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would start by focusing on participation for sure. Um, and then also using the data that you might know about those folks to drive their giving. Um, Maybe they don't respond most to more generalized campaigns. Brian, anything you would add specific there? I'm thinking on it. Yeah, you can take a look at rnl.com. We have a paper on young alumni engagement, a couple of them, and we received some resources from the Schuler Education Foundation to do the largest survey of young alumni that's ever been done. And we asked the young alumni, what areas do you support? And a whopping 6% of them said they want to give to the annual fund. Wow. But 50% or greater of them are indicating interest in scholarships, the environment, okay? Intriguingly, all things that the annual fund supports. So uh, I used to say, if you wanna market to young alumni, market with impact. I think that's garbage. I think it's all donors now. Um, so I think it really is about saying, how do we, it, you go back to those prepositions, uh, two, four, and through, right? You're gonna establish a brand. You're gonna need to market an annual fund you may be expected in a budget relieving sense to get a lot of unrestricted giving, but uh, really think about what are people giving for and then what is that collaborative effort through in terms of what the current students, faculty, and other people are doing. So I want to bring it back to that point. You're going to have a lot more success. And so it is not true that unrestricted giving is dead, but unrestricted giving just for the sake of giving to our structural budget deficit, it's probably not a great, that's not a great pitch in this day and age. I would focus on where you're having impact. Also, I'd like to reveal uh, my kind of impatience for non-mobile friendly giving. So I hate to bring it down to a logistical level, but if I can't auto-populate like my Apple Pay in there, like I'm bouncing, unless you're like super close to my heart, please right now, maybe not right now, when this is over, take out your phone, try to navigate to give your, give your organization a gift. And if I have to click more than like 12 times to get there, like forget it. So um, not to take it down to kind of the most basic, but also don't forget about making it as easy and frictionless as possible for young people to give. Yeah, we've seen people who have adopted things like digital wallet, which Lauren described there, which is the opportunity for people to give with the payment technology that's already installed, Venmo, PayPal, Apple Pay. Instantly upon adoption, a third of the gifts come through the mobile wallet. Right. So that's just a key component of things you have to do in terms of reducing friction. There's no excuse for us not all to have mobile friendly giving pages right now. And you want me to get in a fight with uh, stakeholders at your institution, I'll do it any day. I'll show them the data. But uh, the, the audacity of us to think that people have to give in the way that we want them to give, they're not getting anything other than uh, the joy of philanthropy. Right. They're not getting socks or, or new shoes. Right. So why, why, how dare us? How dare us make it hard to give? We put a link to the report Brian had mentioned in the chat. If you're watching this on recording, get a get a hold of us. We're going to tell you how to do so right. um, in just a couple of seconds here, um, and we'll connect you with that content. Lots of great content. Yes. So get a hold of us afterwards. Um, we want to um, make sure that Brian and Lauren both um, have an opportunity to tell us takeaways. So if I came here today and I wanted to learn about Giving Tuesday, what is one thing you would want or a couple of things that you would want someone to take away from this discussion? And I'll start with our guest, Brian. So I'd say it's a global movement, and you have permission to be very upfront about the philanthropic impact to your organization on this day. And that's the reason why it's there. I would encourage everyone to go head over to the Giving Tuesday website. They have really put a lot of time and effort into resources that are available, including like recent st academic studies on donors. A study that they just pub uh, highlighted the other day showed that telling stories 
causes people to be uh, more likely to be pro-social uh, than even just talking about the transaction of giving. So really powerful resources there. I would say the other thing too is don't be shy to reach out to the commercial partners, whether it's a Mongoose, whether it's RNL, other great companies out there. We spend all day researching this stuff so that we can tell you about it. Uh, lean in and ask us. Go to a couple of us. You know, you, you definitely want to you know get opinion because we are selling stuff as well too. But really lean into the companies as well too because we have a lot of data and can help pr provide the answers. But I would say participate in the movement. Um, right now, I hope you're all thinking about where you're going to give. Uh, you should be able to answer that question. If you hit a donor up for some money on Giving Tuesday and they ask you, where did you give? You better have that answer ready. So uh, we all have to give as well too to the degree that we can. Yeah, um, adding to that, I'm just say stay focused. I know we talked about a lot of different strategies today. All of those, uh, you know, the tech stack, you might not be able to implement them all. Choose one that you feel like would be most impactful to your organization and go with that. We know budgets are a real thing. Um, Storytell, Stay focused. What What is the brand of this day for your institution? How is it different than your institutional day of giving if you have one? Um, so brand it. And so if you brand it, keep that in mind so that all of your decisions, your content, and the way that you convey things are kind of filtered through that so that the messaging is focused. We talked about omni-channel. I love the idea of having one story and deep diving into that story about that thing. And then each channel reinforcing the messaging that was also in the other channel. I think that's kind of at the heart of omni-channel, but just to break it down to you, um, to say it's one story and then just different messaging reinforcing that same story is coming at me from different directions. Um, and then how highlighting the impact that your organization has on your community, uh, pick a couple that are compelling and deep dive into those um, to inspire action. So again, it, it makes it feel like a community centered experience, not just give to us, but like give to us so that we can do X. Um, Brian, you said give to, for, and through. Is that the correct way. You got think, it. Those are the key prepositions. I think that those are, are wonderful to keep in mind of choosing different ways that people can uh, be part of that day for your org organization. I told you, Brian and Laura were going to be great. They were. They were Fantastic. excellent. Yeah. Brian, Lauren, thank you both so much for joining us yes. today and offering your insight. Awesome. This Before episode was brought to you by Mongoose, uh, makers of higher ed's premier engagement platform, Cadence. Um, thank you to our audience for being yes, here. Yes, this was a yeah. great episode. We lots and lots of questions, engagement. comments. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, give yourself all a pat on the back. Thank you very much. Anything else? No. All right. Brian and Lauren, thank you so much again. Um, you guys have a great uh, Giving Tuesday.